sand that is on the seashore. And by Abraham's offspring, all the nations of the earth would gain blessing for themselves because Abraham had obeyed God's voice. Later, Abraham's grandson, Jacob, would be, later be known as Israel, and Jacob's children will be the beginning of the 12 tribes. Now, fast forward roughly 2,000 years, and Jesus comes on the scene. And by that time, there is a sect of holy Jewish men known as the Pharisees. They distinguish themselves by their strict observance of traditional and written law. And they were proud and self-righteous. And they had this perception that they were the most superior and the most holy of all Israel. But to the Pharisees, following the law had become a habit. It was something they did simply because it was something they did, something because they were better than everyone else. And as long as they did this thing, they could continue to be better than everyone else. So they thought. But their hearts weren't in it. There was no love for following the law, which in fact centered on the love for God and one's neighbor. Their work had ceased to be about love and had become nothing more than a dumbed down task of following the letter of the law with no regard whatsoever to the intent behind that law. They had forgotten that the core of the law was love. Now, Jesus, whose work to uplift the poor and oppressed was systematically threatening the power and persuasion that the Pharisees held over the people. And there he was sharing a meal with the very people that the Pharisees made sure to shun. In their eyes, these sinners were beneath any true holy person. And even more than that, Jesus was the guest of home uh, of honor in the home of Levi, a tax collector, a Roman tax collector. And you have to understand the, 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 general, the feelings of the general Jewish population toward one of their own Jewish neighbors who were working for Rome. To, to put it in today's context, imagine for a minute that, that a foreign power had had somehow conquered the Commonwealth of Virginia. We were under the, the, the power of a, of a foreign dictator. And the only way that we could stop this dictator from doing horrible things to ourselves and to our families and our neighbors was to pay him taxes so that he would leave us alone. Then imagine one of your neighbors going to work for this tyrant. And that neighbor gets paid to collect money from you and the rest of your neighbors to pay the dictators so that you wouldn't all be murdered. Levi, also known as Matthew, was one such Jew who worked as a tax collector for the Roman Empire. People like him, they were seen as a, as a leech on Jewish society. And they were traitors that deserved to be treated with the most disdain. And then there was Jesus, eating, drinking, and making merry with these traitors who had continuously hurt these people. There was a time in my life when I identified with the sinners in this story that Jesus is eating with. The ones who were so despised by their religious leaders. I was raised in a Pentecostal holiness church and I was born gay. So I know what it's like to be despised by my religious leaders and even by members of my own family. And I remember feeling unworthy of my family's love and listening to their words, unworthy of God's love. But after years of therapy and theological deconstruction, meeting and marrying my wife, with whom I have a family that is full of unconditional love, and finding a church family 
that accepted me as a gay Christian, I finally, finally came to know that I was in fact welcome at God's table anytime. The problem is, now that I'm on good footing with that, there are times on occasion where I identify with the Pharisees. When I see God's blessings on the church that hurt me or on the family members that want nothing to do with me, I can't help but grumble and wonder why in the world God would ever give their blessing to those people when they hurt me. Why would God bless those people when they hurt their neighbors, when they do not show love for their neighbors if they're different from themselves? It's not that they're bad people. They're just misled, but they hurt me, and that makes me angry. And so I grumble when I see God's blessings on them, because how can God have my back if he is blessing my oppressors? The Pharisees were grumbling about the same thing. They were pointing out the shortcomings of the people that Jesus was keeping company with, wonder, wondering why in the world that he would not only eat with Roman tax collectors, but even call one of them to be a devoted disciple, to travel with him permanently. I'd be thinking, he doesn't deserve that. He doesn't deserve that. But Jesus was doing a new thing. By his presence there, he was proclaiming to anyone who had eyes to see and ears to hear that the ta tax collectors and even the Pharisees, everybody is welcome at the table of God. No matter where a person has come from or what atrocious crimes they have committed, even to me or to you, they will never be separated from the love of God. All they ever need do is come to the table and say, here I am, Lord. And the very action of breaking bread in Matthew's house was proclamation enough. But Jesus being Jesus, he told a parable while he was there. And this one was about wineskins. Well, first it was about patching a garment. You don't patch an old garment with cloth from a new one. That one's pretty self-explanatory. But the one about the wineskins, see, at the time in, in Israel, liquids were contained and carried around in, in animal hides, usually goat skins. And when wine is first made and they're poured into these containers, the wine ferments and it lets off a lot of gas. And so the new wineskins have the elasticity to stretch with that gas and they can continue to hold it. But now if you try to pour wine into old wineskins, there's no elasticity left in it. It's already been used up. Its season is done. Its time is done and it will burst. And you'll lose all your wine. So new wine must always go into new skins. And what Jesus was telling them with this parable and us as well as that we cannot, we cannot do a new thing if we're still going about business as usual. We cannot do a new thing if we are content to follow the same old traditions that have been handed down. The traditions that we are comfortable with and we are used to the way that they flow and we already know how they work, even if they don't work that well, but they're predictable and they're comfortable and they're familiar. Who would want new wine? The old wine works just fine. Why would anyone want to do a new thing when the old ways of doing things work just fine? See, the Pharisees, they have become comfortable in their traditions. And the sinners had become comfortable after a fashion, at least it was familiar. Because see, it, it almost gave them a little bit of an out. See, if, if what they were told was true, if they didn't really matter, well, then their actions really didn't matter. Both parties had grown comfortable with the system. The oppressed didn't try to ra rise up because they saw no point. They would only end up hurt or killed. 
And the Pharisees didn't try to love the people they led because they saw no point. They followed this tangible law and these traditions that had been handed down. There was no need to think any further. But Jesus brought new wine. He came to bring a new way of doing things. He came to tell the Pharisees and the sinners and the tax collectors that it's not about them. And it's not about us. Even if we ourselves are being oppressed as the Jews were, and that included the Pharisees, it's strange to think the Pharisees were oppressed. They were a part of the oppressed people. We will only ever help ourselves by helping each other. We cannot rise as individuals, but we have to rise together. And that means that we cannot continue to perpetuate a broken system in which we find ourselves when it means that we leave the oppressed in the margins. In other words, Jesus is saying, wake up. You cannot continue on the way that you've been going. We are all called to do this new thing together. We are called to see that even our most dire enemy has a place at God's table. It doesn't mean you have to sit beside them, but they have a place there, just like we do. We are called to change in ways as individuals and as a society that are going to not be comfortable. My wife, she gave this sermon and and, and there's this picture of a rock, you know, uh, people paint rocks. Uh, it's something that we love to do, especially as an outreach. And, and on one side, there's this black circle and it says your comfort zone. There's nothing special about it. But then over here, there's this bright, colorful circle, and it says where the magic happens, where the magic happens. That only ever happens outside of your comfort zone. So we have a choice. Every day, with every decision we make, we have a choice. We can either stay in our comfort zones where things are predictable, and comfortable, or we can do something new and we can go where the magic happens. Amen. Please uh, join us in song. We lift our voices, number seven.